Okay. Everybody hear me? Yeah. Let's, uh, this is actually uh, Wednesday in the middle of the semester, so, oh yeah, and I remember, it's OSHA. Um, so what, what I want to do today is, um, is, is talk about the late imperial era from 1861 to 1914. I'm going to talk over this music just for a second or two because I'd like to introduce the era with um, an, an audio impression. Uh, um, I, I, I want to introduce the era. Uh, I'm on. Yeah, or I can't. No, this is the national anthem, actually. This is God Save the Tsar. So basically, what he's singing is um, God Save or Preserve the Tsar. Boje Zaryu Sakhrani. Um, and the powerful, um, uh, um, authoritative Tsar, uh, his glory is our glory. And basically, this refrain and this motif runs through the throughout the, the song. Now you, you'd have to simply imagine this um, with a chorus or with a military orchestra or at the beginning of a performance in the Marinsky Theater with perhaps on a special holiday the royal family in the royal box um, uh, to switch and um, if I was 18, I'd be much hipper when it comes to all of this, but I'm not, so I have to do it this way. This is um, something called um, the Marsh Slav, the Slavic March, written, I hope it starts, um, by uh, um, uh, Tchaikovsky in, um, in 1880. You can hear the sort of melodious tones beginning. It's a, probably a familiar um, a piece to, uh, to many people. It was actually written at the end of um, uh, one of the Russo-Turkish Wars uh, uh, it, between 1878 and 1880, um, a military victory for imperial arms and for a reformed army, um, 20 years after the abolition of serfdom, marking actually, especially for domestic educated and elite opinion, a very important benchmark um, marking the emergence and the growth of a modern Russian empire, powerful enough, in fact, to defend its Slavic brethren um, from the Ottoman infidel in the Balkans, the beginning, actually, the continuation of a story, of course, that eventually would lead, unbeknownst to everyone here, um, everyone here. Uh, <laughs> one of my problems, actually, is that, you know, I'm not here, I'm there, um, actually. Uh, uh, unbeknownst to all of them, that would lead ultimately in, in, in 1914 to um, the outbreak of the First World War. Um, there are motifs um, uh, interwoven into this music that are popular and folkloric and peasant and thus really resonate with the Russian soul and the Russian heart. Um, um, it's a typical piece of, to actually just bring it up a little bit more, of Tchaikovsky, um, of Tchaikovsky music. What I want you to imagine here, though, is um, put yourself inside a lifetime. Very easy for this audience. From 1880, or eight, for that matter, 1860 through 1914. Well, but it's easy. Unfortunately, it's easy for me. <laughs> I can do it very easily, right? <laughs> um, half century, no problem, right? Quarter century of parenthood, no problem. I, I mean, I've done all of this to my utter um, bewilderment at, at, at times, right? So listen to the music, right, that's filling your ears. And think about a word that I've used before, discourse, right? Um, the way in which ideas and values and constructs actually inform our universe and literally float around us and in a, and in a way inform our individual behavior, inform our collective behavior, inform our collective memory, inform our individual memory. 
It applies to sound as well because, of course, this sort of sound is also, any musicologist would tell you, is also very much discourse. Right? All right, so in a lifetime, right, let's stop and switch and go from 1880, if this won't abandon me, to um, 1912, 13. In your lifetime. Now, well, not in this lifetime, but easily in a lifetime, so that you heard the book that I just finished writing on Sergei Vita. Vita, who was born in 1849, went to the Mariinsky, or went to the Grand Philharmonic Hall in St. Petersburg, and heard the Slavic March. And certainly in 1912, he read the reviews, because everyone did, about the debut in Paris of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. Which as, every, which, as people know, and if you don't, it's a fantastic story, when it was first performed, it caused a riot in the Opera House in Paris, as people heard this. Now, think about the Slavic March for a second, and now listen to these sounds. Now, to our ear, they're not quite a tonal anymore. There's a melody here, actually. I was thinking this morning that the our, our symphony um, in last year, the year before, I forget exactly when, um, had a program of um, uh, contemporary American composers. And they would perform, at the, at the beginning of each one of the concerts, they would perform a piece from, oftentimes an unknown, unless you were a literati, um, an unknown American composer. Very atonal music, right? Melodious in some ways, I mean, it, 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 as a, member of the Blair Quartet playing a piece like that in the Dean's residence in our home actually not too long ago, an, an incredible quartet, um, uh, uh, said it makes the audience work. You can't just sit there. Well, you know, that's atonal music. To our ears, this is almost melodious. But to their ears, it caused a riot. But within a year, it had been noted across the continent, this piece, as a breakthrough in music, as the next step beyond, who still the Tchaikovsky's and the Beethoven's and the Brahms of the 19th century were still in many ways dominating the musical scene, but be it Stravinsky, or to actually you know, take one other um, sidebar, be it Einstein, who in fact was developing at the turn of the century um, his general theories of relativity, although largely for audiences that weren't physicists at all, but that were, uh, Oli Moldvig, a great new professor in our department, um, writes on, on, on this stuff. Basically, Einstein's early writings right after the turn of the century were largely read by mathematicians and received by those small reading audiences as mathematical theory and mathematical breakthrough. But be it Stravinsky or be it Einstein, right? Think about the shift. Think about the change that's taking place in just a lifetime. But of course, this isn't the only kind of music. Uh, I, lost, I forgot the translation in my office, so this is actually going to not quite work as well. This is gypsy music. So actually, it's a poem called The Peddler, The Peddlers from um, the 1860s that's being performed around the turn of the century. As we'll see a little bit more today, one way for women to find a place in public life in a society that was still, the world, word belongs, very patriarchal, was on the stage. And one place women in the capital cities in particular found themselves on the stage was in restaurant bars. And gypsy music, and that's what this is, gypsy music, gypsy romance was one format to stardom, one pathway to stardom. And basically what this, uh, this is racy. And this is actually, this is erotic, quite honestly. This is Victorian eroticism. So the story here basically is about a traveling itinerant peddler who comes to a village, and of course all the young women are agog at this young, strapping, mysterious fellow. But the poem is basically about um, 
actually written in 1861, The Era of Emancipation. The poem ultimately is about emancipation, but of a very different kind. Right? Because the peddler actually is inviting the young girl to see his wares that he's willing to lay out for them in the fields at night. Now, you know, um, uh, this part of history, friends, right? Um, it's actually a much more interesting part of history in many ways than a lot of the political stuff that we've been that we've been looking at. But the other point that I want to make is that, you know, this is very much a part of popular culture as well. A popular culture that's actually penetrating into reaches of society that in a previous generation would have known much less about it perhaps and certainly would have been much less willing to admit being entertained by it. So, you know, this is a restaurant clientele that is in many ways like this audience with enough disposable income to actually be entertained, with enough connections to actually know about and gain access to a famous Moscow restaurant where this song is being um, uh, uh, performed. And then finally, one final piece of music to add to the mix. This is called the Varsovienie. It's, um, it's basically a workers' revolutionary marching song with Polish origins, thank goodness, right? Um, and basically, you can listen for a, a bit, right? Um, it's better in chorus. You can imagine the one trumpet and maybe the drum and the tuba um, and perhaps even the forest gathering where workers, because as we'll see today, an industrial working class is emerging in this society. Got to have one if you're going to actually have a revolution that ostensibly um, is a worker's revolution and creates ostensibly a worker state. Um, once we get through <laughs> the preamble here, basically, you know, this is a call to crowds of the oppressed to step forward boldly and bravely into the bloody, decisive battle. And we'll call on, on this bold people to step into the bloody battle. And when the chorus comes, Marsh, Marsh, Preyod, Rabochi, Narod. March, March forward working people. Now, I'm not advocating anything. All I'm asking you to do by way of introduction to today's lecture about the late imperial era, last time I talked about the intensity and the complexity of modernity in European life in the 19th century. So consider the menu, the panoply, maybe even the cacophony of sound that you've just heard. Uh, a czarist national anthem, written in the 1840s, not in some deep ancient myth, uh, mists, um, written in the era of Nicholas I. Um, a, a, a Tchaikovsky uh, symphony at the height of Tchaikovsky's power. A year later, he'll write um, the 1812 overture. I mean, neither one of them basically being his key pieces of work, but this is the age of Tchaikovsky um, in, in, in Russian music. Stravinsky, right, and talk about finding a way to attach some sort of meaning to cacophony, particularly if your ear is accustomed to Tchaikovsky or gypsy romances and the titillating kind of um, subject matter to be found within them. Or a worker's march, which marks, of course, a whole era of popular politics that in the subsequent sections of this um, uh, of these lectures we have to um, deal with as, as well. So, you know, if you, as I do two things here, uh, hang on, uh, if you think about this period that we're looking at um, today, the late imperial era, 1861-1914, it is a lifetime. Uh, it's supplied, this lifetime has supplied employment to several generations of minimally Columbia University graduates. I know that for a fact. Um, uh, and within a lifetime, right, we're looking at, uh, for, my, for my money, 
one of the most turbulent and interesting of historical laboratories that there actually is. Um, so what I'd, I'd like to do is to begin thinking about this era, I want to talk just a bit about larger um, demographic and socioeconomic characteristics of the age, and then actually sort of do a slideshow about the people who, who, who roamed around with, within it. So um, the first thing that, that has to be said about this era, and reference has been made to it before, is that particularly in the second half of the 19th century, although demographers would talk about the entire 19th century, Russia has its character, the characteristic population boom of the modern era takes place within the Russian Empire, largely in the second half of the 19th century. A standard marker of modernity, I mean, it's like, again, you have to give this as part of the answer, right, is a, popu is, is a population explosion that in many ways is, of course, continuing um, down to this, um, to this very moment. Um, you can see the intensity and the scale of the demographic expansion. This is not, by the way, demographic expansion, as was the case in the late 18th century, that's um, abetted by imperial conquest and expansion. This is pure population boom. And it's a population boom, moreover, that is um, largely to be explained not by public health and declining mortality, although that plays a minor role. Um, infant mortality basically stays the same across the era. So, you know, I mean, the number is about 250 um, infant deaths prior to the age of one per 1,000 live births, and that more or less stays constant, more or less, across this entire era. Right, yeah, yeah, it's, right. It's a peasant society, right? It's, um, it, it's a peasant society where, where the economy, the, the word subsistence that I've used repeatedly, subsistence has a, a real meaning, and one way of, of thinking about subsistence is to put that sort of statistic beside it, right? Think about, you know, old age is 40 in a peasant village. Um, so it, it's, but, and, but basically what's going on here, it's not, um, it's not in, improving public health, it's not declining death, it's basically all being accounted for by rising birth rates. So this is by rising birth rates, I'm sorry. So basically by an expansion of the population and families having more children. <laughs> I was told last week that I have to actually um, repeat for everybody the comments that come from the audience, so I'm now officially fulfilling that function by saying, um, the peddler got around, right? <laughs> wasn't, this, again, wasn't my comment, um, right? You know, you, you can actually be written up on student evaluations for things like that, you know, so. <laughs> um, uh, th this, um, this population expansion is accompanied by, and of course they're fundamentally connected by a period of industrial and commercial expansion that's particularly marked from in these dates. I mean, it really is, it, it, it's a, a 19th century phenomenon. If you were to graph it, however, you'd have a very slow, gradual rise across the first half of the century um, with um, a minimal, a minor peak around the 1860s and the time of emancipation, but particularly from the 1880s on, a fairly steep upward curve. You can see this, um, two important parts about this um, uh, commercial and industrial expansion. Um, the first set of numbers, and these are really crude and, and rough, so you know, they're industrial indices that I, I grabbed out of this book, and an economic historian, basically, economic historians will grapple with how do you actually come up with comparative measures of national income or um, GDP, gross domestic product, gross national product. Um, it's, a, it's a separate um, uh, field of historical research and a very sophisticated and complex subdiscipline, which I'll admit I don't know a whole lot about. But you know, what we can say is that these numbers do give some sort of comparative notion. If 1913 is on this industrial index scale is 100, does give you some sense of the major powers in Europe and the way in which national income, of course, across the board is expanding in this era. An era of coal, of iron, of steel, of petroleum, of railroads, of telegraphs, of mass print, mass press, 
um, expanding universal education. You know, the list goes on and on and on to explain again what is the, the beginnings of the life that we live today, especially in the West. The other thing that you can see from this first graph about indices of industrial production is the rapid process of catch-up that the Russian Empire is involved in from the time of the emancipation onward. So that by the time you get to, and these are rough, so I'm not saying that France is richer than Russia, which is richer than UK and Germany, but I think that you, know, you can say that by the eve of the First World War, if you look at levels of national income being generated by the commercial industrial plant of these polities, by all industrial, commercial, and entrepreneurial activity put together, that Russia has, over the course of about a half century or so, managed to catch up with its main rivals on the European continent. Is just as wealthy and just as powerful. One other point and then the question, okay? And that's this. Um, uh, economic historians will talk about the Asian pattern of industrial development that, in particular, Russia contrasts UK that in particular Russia actually engages and reflects over the course of this, um, of this half century. In the United Kingdom, um, and even more so in the United States, uh, European, this book doesn't have those numbers, but basically you can say that in fact the behemoth here um, is, uh, uh, is the US. And what's happening in the United States, of course, is a generation of economic wealth so massive that it's creating the middle class life um, that for many Americans basically is a universal given. All societies have a middle class life as we'll see here. This is not true um, to the same extent in the empire at all. Um, that means in a place like the United States, per capita national wealth, the sum total of all national wealth divided by the sum total of the population, per capita national wealth is respectable. I don't have the number at my fingertips, but it reflects this this growing wealth that brings somebody like Theodore Roosevelt to power, or that actually, in fact, you know, leads the United States to begin to think about not only its national destiny on the North American continent, but across the entire world, or that, that allows um, E.L. Doctorow to write about the American middle class uh, as, as, as it's emerging at, at this time. In Russia, on the other hand, and this is the point that you've all probably read at this point, um, there's an Asian pattern of industrial development where um, significant expansion of national wealth and significant expansion of population means low per capita income. So standards of living in the Russian Empire are the lowest of pretty much any of the, of, of the developing or developed countries. Russia's per capita national income was 40% less than France and Germany, 80% less than the UK, and 90% that of the United States of America. So you can have very significant commercial and industrial expansion, and you can have very significant demographic expansion, but you still basically have a population, the comment about, geez, 250 out of 1,000 um, deaths per live births, you can still have 250 deaths per 1,000 live births because you still have relatively low per capita um, income um, within this society at the turn of the century right, and before the First World War. You had a question. Yeah. And then after uh, Russia lost the Japanese, uh, I don't know, around 1898 or something, everybody called it the sad sack of Europe or whatever it was. But well, they were right under Russia. No, um, I mean, I, I want to talk about this for, for one more slide. But the, the question basically is that it's, um, it's remarkable to look at these numbers and to see how far behind countries like Russia and Germany actually are in the middle of the 19th century, how quickly they catch up to England and to France, and even um, if, and this is actually a subject for the next two lectures, um, e despite Russia's defeat at the hands of Japan um, in, in 1904 and 1905, but right after the beginning of the 20th century, you get this impression of Russia as being some sort of sad sack, um, but the numbers actually suggest exactly the opposite. Um, two not altogether cute responses, but they're kind of curt. One, nothing. Nothing makes for economic expansion like war. Uh, 
and, and in particular military defeat, which requires rearmament. And that's one of the things that's actually going on um, after 1905. Um, as you'll see in a second, there's also a self-sustaining industrial and economic expansion going on. The larger point about um, Germany and uh, Russia versus England and France is, a, is the story of European industrialization, which in many ways begins in, in England. And so you, know, you can go to England today and you can basically see the history of the textile industry spread out all over the place. I mean, basically it's as if they took Gary, Indiana and turned it into a museum for the steel industry, right? my, uh, someplace close to my hometown. Um, England is basically scattered with the history of the Industrial Revolution, and it dates back to the, 18th, to the second half of the 18th century. It begins in England, it begins in France, um, it, and it basically spreads its way across the continent. By the time you get to the middle of the 19th century, Germany, and later stages of the, of the 19th century Russia, it needs to be said that it happens in Russia in the most compact period of time. So here we're talking about industrialization, rapid, compressed, complex, contradictory. Um, well, just take the explanation about music that you heard, translate it into economic terms, and you've got an explanation for economic history that fits as well, right? Because you heard Tchaikovsky and Stravinsky all in the course of a lifetime. You went from a, being a farmer to an industrial worker all in the course of a lifetime. Bob. An, an enormous amount, an enormous amount. Um, and, and it's actually a pattern that, um, that deeply informs um, Russian industrial policy um, as commercial and industrial policy as well. That you can take, that larger amounts of territory can be seen not simply as a source of taxation and um, soldiers, uh, basically human resources that can be mobilized into the state, state treasury, but large expanses of territory, in the Russian case, a Eurasian expanse of territory, is a huge internal domestic market, which if you harness it for purposes of both domestic and foreign investment, um, is an engine that potentially is, at the beginning of the 20th century, I'm paraphrasing Sergei Vitta, I know this is true, um, uh, uh, it opens up prospects of almost unlimited wealth into the 20th century. It's not just useless land. It's a huge untapped market that lies in Europe and in Asia. And German unification actually, in fact, also informed that because basically the creation of a German empire and the elimination of the Germanese and the creation of a Germany actually also plays in similar sorts of ways. Okay, um, one other thing about this before moving on to the slideshow. I mean, let's basically think about the fact that this is an industrializing Russia. This is, um, the pictures suggest, you know, this is the heyday of the first industrial revolution. So as I said before, you know, this is, this is the carbon revolution. I listened to a climate change session in my house last night by um, uh, Jonathan Gilligan, um, an associate professor from the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. And, you know, basically, they're, they're talking about how conservation actually can limit um, the amount of carbon released. In the, you don't have to have a carbon tax. You don't have to actually have huge, and at the moment, um, irremediable uh, uh, political conflicts over all of this. You can actually pull the charger out of the wall. You can actually walk. You can actually eat one less cheeseburger a week. Um, and in fact, actually have a very significant impact on the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere. Well, the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere is as a result of the Industrial Revolution that did all this. And it's a carbon industrial revolution. It's based on coal. It's based on iron. And once they figure out steel, it's based on steel. And once they figure out coal, iron, and steel, it's by the time um, Rockefeller comes along and Nobel and others, it's based on oil and petroleum. And it's happening in Russia um, from the 1880s onward. Um, we basically saw, and I'm just reiterating, that um, uh, the extent of this expansion, right, and the amount of wealth that's actually being generated. And the third thing that I want to emphasize about, about this is the very important role that the Russian imperial state plays in, in industrialization, suggested by some of these, of these photographs. 
in a ministerial state takes as its responsibility from the 1880s onward and particularly under the, the aegis of Sergei Vita um, in, in the 1890s takes as its, as its responsibility um, rapid industrial development. And it's a choice that has to be made because there are constituencies within the imperial state that reach into the royal court and actually reach to the Tsar, both Alexander III and Nicholas II, that argue that the role of the state is to preserve social order. And the last thing this is, is social order. Unless you're able to retort, on the contrary, Your Majesty, national wealth is social order. National wealth is the commonweal. And that, big, that debate is largely won by ministerial bureaucrats who work in places like the finance ministry, the state bank, um, the treasury, um, uh, who engage in a revolving door uh, phenomenon, familiar to our politics today as well, where um, office in the ministerial state, especially professional and expert office in the ministerial state, gives you entree and access to the banking industry to corporate boards of directors, to um, executive positions in manufacturing and industrial firms, transportation companies. Vita, for example, um, a nobleman by birth, born in Tbilisi and Tiflis in 1849. His father and his grandfather, both civil servants, in colonial Georgia, um, goes to university at the age of 17 and a half in Odessa, Majors in mathematics, unlike his father before him and his grandfather who didn't have a university education at all, most bureaucrats actually majored in law. He was on the physics and mathematics faculty. Decided that he wanted to be a professor. His mother said at the Dvaryanske Diola, that's not a nobleman's business. So he actually used connections, aristocratic patronage networks, use connections to get a position as an employee on a state-owned railroad being constructed out of Odessa toward Kiev, um, one of the major grain and mineral regions of the entire empire, where he embarked upon a career that lasted him through the 1880s, um, and that included becoming the chief executive operating officer of the Southwestern Railroads, the largest privately owned railroad network in all of Ukraine that did business in Germany in the Danube River Valley, on the Black Sea, and all the way east to the Volga River Valley, in grain, in human transportation, in mineral transportation, and basically in fostering. Bob asked earlier about markets and imperial space. My answer was Vita's answer. Right? Um, and the railroad actually spans that, that sort of space. Um, he then, in 1889, steps into the Ministry of Finance, where within five years, because of his own brilliance, basically, um, has ingratiated himself to a significant degree with Alexander III, a arch-conservative and anti-Semitic man, but a good Victorian gentleman, who basically buys the argument, yes, order and commonweal is national economic wealth. Build the Trans-Siberian, which Vita does, and constructs essentially um, with a tariff system, with state spending, um, with support of uh, industry and capital investors, both domestic and especially foreign, with monetary policy that puts the Russian ruble, a notoriously weak paper currency, on the gold standard by 1896 to provide a stable investment climate. You're interested in investing in things Russian? Pajalsta. Please, we'll do whatever it takes for you to bring your business and your technical expertise and your blueprints and your savvy into the empire to start building whatever it is you build. Cloth, scientific instruments, guns, you name it. Right? Um, and there, if you think about the role of the state in that stream of consciousness story, that's 250 pages that I'm now actually working through the copy editing of, and it's killing me. Um, if you think about that, that stream of consciousness, you know, there's the role of the state. Um, there's actually the revolving door between private business and state business. 
there's actually a kind of corporate state structure where the lines that divide public and private are very inchoate and very obscure, where the state actually plays the historical role that the state's always played in Russian history. It's an agent of change. Yeah. Yes. That's right. The qu <laughs> manufactured goods. Um, uh, manufactured goods that, um, depending on the time you're looking at and the audience that you're talking about, could be um, uh, consumer goods, particularly the nobility that has a lot of disposable income, or could be manufactured goods, rails, locomotives. Um, one of the ministerial policies that's put in place is a series of commercial treaties and high tariffs. So basically, there's a protectionist policy that's put in place at the end of the 19th century to protect Russian industry against foreign competition that's accompanied by a set of individual commercial treaties signed with Germany, France, the United States, Egypt, a whole list of trading partners that essentially establishes most favored nation trading status. You lower your tariffs for our agricultural goods, and we'll lower our tariffs for certain categories of your manufactured goods or of your chief export. This is an international capitalist order, right? And all of these people fully understand the interdependency of these nation states within this international order because ultimately you're not only exporting grain to earn foreign currency, you're also creating market conditions to attract foreign investment. It's actually the bigger source of, of capital for this expansion is actually coming from foreign investment. And eventually, by the time you get into the, into the first decade of the 20th century, um, um, a, a self-sustaining expansion of, of, of this process, the biggest indicator of which is the growth of domestic capital investment as well. So it starts with foreign. And by the, you know, by the eve of the First World War, you have an increasing significance of domestic capital investment going on as, as, as well. This is a burgeoning capitalist order. Any other questions? All right, well, um, having done that, like I said, it's the middle of the week. I have to get out my little watch here to figure out exactly where we are time-wise. One of these days I have to get a wristwatch. Um, <laughs> let's, um, let's actually look at, um, at, at imperial society itself. But, and here I just want to very briefly um, give you some sense of the formal legal order of this society. Everybody, has, everybody in this room has a domestic passport, the equivalent of a driver's license. And on that piece of state paper is your name, your birth, other key data, but also your seslovia, or your estate. It's a legal category that's enshrined in Russian law um, in the 1830s, it's the product, as all law is, of a longer process of historical development. And it's a reflection of the way in which, you've heard me say this multiple times, the state attempted to mobilize and reach out to contact so it could use the population. So it organized the population into legal groups. Legal groups, all of whom, and here you can really see the influence of Peter the Great, legal groups, all of whom had a service function in the state. So, you know, th actually this is in law. Now this isn't the sole identity. So I walk up to you and say, who are you? And you immediately say, I'm a, I'm a nobleman. I'm not suggesting that at all. But if you actually went through that identity exercise, it wouldn't be too long before you would get to, I'm a nobleman. Because it would be obvious that he's a peasant and it would be obvious that he's a priest. And it would possibly even be obvious that the two of you were um, merchants. From your dress, from your speech, from your language, from you know, your cultural values themselves. A whole hierarchy. In the Soviet period, you know, we like to talk about the nomenclatura, the organizational chart in a way. You could see this as an organizational chart of sorts that expanded to the entire society. It increasingly, in the later 19th century, as we're going to see now, doesn't fit all that well with the social reality 
of, um, of, of the society. And it's actually a theme that I want to try to, um, to develop here as well. Actually, the first group that doesn't fit are the people who, in fact, operate and run the place, officials and bureaucrats. It's, that's not in a state of the realm at all. Um, these numbers are rough. In general, turn of the century, 1900, um, the, the, the bureaucracy as a whole is less than a million people. Almost exclusively male. Only in the very last years of the old regime do you begin to see women being hired into um, civil service positions, but these are at low ranking and secretarial levels. And I mean, I've read in the archives, you know, long, meandering, complex debates about whether or not it makes sense to actually have women employed, even in those sorts of positions. Interestingly enough, actually, one of the pro arguments is skill <laughs> and education which is actually beginning to grow as well. The, absolutely. I mean, it's an age of talent, um, as a matter of fact, right? Um, talent increasingly counts in a society like this. Although talent, as, as you saw in that chart, is also fundamentally being balanced against birth and blood. I mean, these are two organizing sociological poles in this society, which increasingly are in conflict with each other. Big deal. My grandfather immigrated from Poland and had only a fifth grade education. And his wife barely even spoke English. Two of his grandsons have PhDs. Talent. Of course, the world that he lived in, he had to escape by getting on a train and then a boat and floating across the ocean by himself to get away from a world that basically defined him by birth. Because he was a peasant and then a coal miner and then draftable. And he said, forget it. I'm out of here. Um, in, uh, in this wandering stream of consciousness, um, an officialdom of almost 900,000 people, decision makers, and essentially that means people to be found in St. Petersburg, in Moscow, and in the 50 provincial capitals of the empire. It's a much smaller number of influential people, like this guy up here. This is a young Sergei Vitek, fresh off the railroads and beginning his rise through um, the Ministry of Finance. Or these young men at the Imperial School of Jurisprudence, an imperial law school that really required um, connections, particularly good, noble, and aristocratic family for entrance. Um, but a degree from the Imperial School of Jurisprudence almost automatically guaranteed you a position of some importance and certainly comfort in a place like Petersburg or Moscow, and also protected you against an assignment in Tobolsk or some other provincial backwater. Um, the vast majority of this apparatus, however, are um, white collar clerks. And they staff <laughs> the apparatus of the empire. It's important to note that as Peter the Great intended it, um, uh, service in the state bureaucracy can lead to ennoblement for talent and service, but basically for promotion through the table of ranks, reaching a rank in the table of ranks, the eighth rank, at which point you and your family are entitled to bear the rights and privileges and titles of, um, of dvoryani, a hereditary nobleman. At the apex of this society is the aristocracy and nobility. And you'll note here that when you put aristocracy together with nobility, you're also stepping outside the framework of the legal order of estates, which only actually grants privilege to the nobleman or to the nobility. Aristocracy, of course, is a reflection of wealth. Aristocracy is a reflection of family pedigree. And aristocracy is um, a reflection of wealth and family pedigree that basically leads to status and standing and privilege. Um, within the networks that constitute politi informal political power within, um, within the empire. Um, the elite of the population, only about 1.5% at most. Arable land still is, even in industrializing Russia, arable land still is a foundational um, source of wealth. And this 1.5% of the population monopolizes about 40% of, um, of that wealth. 
which will be a source of social conflict in the two revolutions of the 20th century in 1905 and in 1917. One and a half percent of the population in a peasantry that's the overwhelming majority of the population that's working about 60 percent of the arable land. That's a kind of imbalance that requires time to be worked out. Um, time is actually one thing that the empire, unbeknownst again to it, um, doesn't, doesn't have. Um, a, a fundamental aspect of the noble experience in the second half of the 19th century is the loss of land. You can see an elite in this last little factoid, an elite that actually derived much of its wealth, certainly, and much of its experience from an era of serfdom, an era that had only ended in 1861, let's remember. And of the total amount of land that the hereditary nobility possessed at the time of emancipation in 1861, by the eve of the First World War, two-thirds of it was gone. Now, if you're an economist, that's a good thing, actually, because it means that that land had passed out of the hands of incompetent entrepreneurs into the hands of more competent people who had the wherewithal and the means and the savvy and the foresight to actually buy it. If you pine, and who doesn't, for an aristocratic and noble past in the 19th century, the loss of the nobility is a tragedy of modernity. So what was Chekhov writing about in the cherry orchard? You know, I mean, basically, if you haven't seen it, the next time it's in town or the next time you have an opportunity to Netflix it or something, you should definitely see it. You want to actually do one thing that will help you understand this era, do the cherry orchard. Where, you know, the owner, a woman, a widow, refuses to sell her estate despite the fact that she could make a whole lot of money on it because it's outside of Moscow and it could be divided up into dacha plots. And she could save the family, Chekhov, um, uh, Cherry Orchard. Uh, she could save the family, save its estate, save the whole history of the place. Just sell it. Huh? I, I couldn't possibly sell it. It's, the Cherry Orchard is the most famous thing in the county. It's, it's in the local almanac, you know. Um, versus, on the other hand, a, um, a, a, the, the entrepreneur who buys it in an attempt to actually try to save the family uh, by doing what uh, Madame Ryaskaya can't do, um, selling the damn thing and taking the money. He'll buy it and give her the cash and cut down the cherry orchard and subdivide it. And yet a Malayev, who was the son of a serf on this estate, in, an, in a crescendo moment of the play, stands on stage and you know, begins to just with the, the enthusiasm and the passion of a man of the new era that's basically cascading down upon the empire, um, stands there with the realization that I, Yerimolai, the son of a serf on this estate, now own the estate. I own the cherry orchard. My head is spinning. I can't believe it. It's, it's an amazing play that actually captures both aspects of this. The, the passing of an old era, and ultimately the tragedy of it, and the coming of a new era, and the passion and excitement, um, and the unpredictability of it. And of course, it needs to be said that when um, a census is actually taken in 1897, where some of this um, data comes from, and the census takers, the very first one in 1897, come and ask the question, in, in essence, who are you? And they ask two things, Soslovia and occupation. And of course, everybody has to fill out the census, including, of course, this guy, um, who in a picture from 1896, this guy over here on um, my right is the new emperor, Nicholas II. And sitting next to him is his new wife, the Empress Alexandra Fyodorovna. And sitting down in the corner, the uh, youngish looking guy with the beard and um, the Edwardian mustache is his uncle, um, uh, his father's youngest brother, Sergei. And sitting next to him is his wife, Ella, who is Alexandra's um, sister. A very neat family portrait. Nicholas, when asked, Soslovia Dvorianin, nobleman. Occupation, landowner. Uh, privilege has its standing and status in this society, particularly when the emperor himself identifies himself as a noble landowner. 
middling classes. Now, the, I mentioned middle classes before. Um, undergraduates at this point basically all will start writing it down, right? So the answer to the final exam question of what caused the Russian Revolution, there was no middle class in Russia. That's it, right? Which is in some form, I suppose, true, although it's so true, it's a truism, so it ultimately ends up explaining about as much as modernity explains, which isn't a whole lot when you get right down to it. Um, uh, historians prefer to talk about, because this is a developing phenomenon in a period of rapid economic and social and cultural evolution and change, prefer to talk instead about middling classes as a way of finding groups of people who fit into the larger paradigm of what we would think about when we say middle class. I mean, I suppose that you know, there, there may be people in the room who wouldn't classify themselves as middle class. I rather doubt there's anybody in the room who would classify themselves as working class. There might be some people in the room who classify themselves as upper class, although in America we don't like dealing with those sorts of terms. So ultimately, no matter who we are, we're all middle class. Right? Um, which again is something about the way in which Americans take their own experience and project it as a universal out across the entire globe. Um, uh, component elements and hence middling classes. So here's a group that's really brand new. And a term, Svobodnia Profetsi, free professions, that before the 1860s didn't exist at all. Now I had to hopscotch through this uh, sidebar. Norma Clipper told me to tell you, and I forgot at the outset, that these, um, uh, both this lecture and John Locke's lecture are being taped regularly. She will send you an email notifying you how to access those tapes. Several of you have asked about um, sessions that you've, that you've missed. And the PowerPoints will also be hung um, on a pl university platform someplace. We haven't quite um, ironed that out yet, but all of this stuff is, um, is in fact, um, on, on, on the way. Um, Free professions, in this sense, are, are, are interesting um, in, in the sense that it, it literally has in the title free. How could you, what's free about being a professional, a lawyer, a doctor, a professor, or an aspiring professional, a university student? Um, the notion of free professions essentially is that these are professional groups that stand outside the direct control of the state service. These are individuals who are not directly employed by the state or hold rank within the civil bureaucracy. Many of them actually are employed, and it's the reason that they begin to emerge from the 1860s onward, by um, the Zamspa institutions. And I did skip through this, and hence you'll have to go and look at the, um, uh, the film to catch this. But these institutions of local self-administration that are established in the 1860s, um, 33 out of them at provincial level, over 450 of them at county level, and they're all basically given the right to elect local representatives from the local population, the right to tax that local population, the right to um, write budgets, for their activities, and those activities largely are the development of local public infrastructure. Roads, health care, education, agronomic services, surveying, soil science. Um, the Zemstva have to hire professionals to take care of those charges, and this becomes a major source of the development, a demand for, and thus the development of a supply of professionals who don't work directly for the state. They work for these institutions of public self-administration and hence are labeled free. Women who basically go to special courses, the first of their kind in St. Petersburg. They live a very checkered existence. Women are not officially enrolled in Russian universities until after the revolution. Women will travel abroad for training, especially in the medical profession. There is a place in St. Petersburg, the Bestuja Vushi Kursi, they're called, higher women's courses um, that, um, that are a source of training, particularly for primary and secondary education and to a lesser degree for the medical sciences 
um, as, as well. These um, middling classes, starting with the free professions, are, you know, if we think for a moment about, so are they important beyond statistical significance and being free of the state? Who do you think is buying tickets to a Tchaikovsky concert? Or who's sitting in a concert, and here's a sidebar about Victorian women in this, in this era, because this is a patriarchal society. It's a loaded word, but if you're actually going to find some meaning in that adjective of patriarchy, a male-dominated society, Imperial Russia very much still is. Victorian Europe very much still is. Queen Victoria is an exception to the rule. Women are finding places in public space, outside the household that they, in Russia in particular, utterly and totally dominate. All scholarship suggests this, no matter what social class we're actually talking about, but are leaving the household and finding places in public space, particularly on the stage. We heard Gypsy Romance, one of the great opera divas of, of the era. Vita's memoirs, 3,000 pages long, very little about Victorian sexuality or eroticism in there. You have to read between the lines to find it. But boy, one thing every single Victorian male does the scholarship likes to say, is gaze at women. The scholarship talks about the male gaze. And women on stage, opera divas and ballerinas. It's public space. It's access to celebrity, a word that's actually, in fact, beginning to emerge for the first time in this country and across the continent. Um, uh, this woman, in particular, attracts a very particular male gaze. Matilda Shishinska um, is famous basically for two things. She's famous for being the, um, the mistress of Nicholas II while he's still heir and before he, ma he marries Alexandra. Um, and she's famous for the fact that the townhouse in St. Petersburg that he gave to her and that she lived in in 1917 becomes Bolshevik Party headquarters after Lenin comes back um, to, um, to Petrograd. Victorian women and public roles, but still thinking about you know, the assemblage, basically, of middling classes. Another place to stop is to, um, is to think about merchants and entrepreneurs. Now, merchant, kupiets, is a, is an, a Sislovia category. It's an estate category. And merchants historically have served the crown by conducting, in the first instance, especially foreign trade. So at the time of Ivan the Terrible, um, in the middle of the 16th century, a chief item of foreign commerce was Russian timber and tar exported through the White Sea and around Scandinavia to the United Kingdom, to an England that was hungry and rapidly developing its naval forces. You had to have somebody to run that business, so you found yourself a merchant someone who qualified both by connections and a certain amount of available wealth, and they bore the responsibility for those, that commercial foreign transaction. That tradition continues so that you actually have people who hold official rank in the state and thus status and legal privilege in the state as merchants. 250 to 500,000 individual families concentrated in particular in the major areas of domestic and international business in the empire, all of them around the periphery with the exception of Moscow. St. Petersburg and the Baltic. Kiev, Odessa, and Kharkov feeding um, to Odessa and the Black Sea. Um, uh, Baku and Astrakhan, the Caspian. Wuch um, and Russian Poland, basically you know, an overland entree to all of Central and Western Europe, and especially, again, to the Baltic Sea and Moscow, especially now in, a, in an era of railroads, very much at the center right, of a nexus that stretches um, across European Russia and into Asia as well. But in addition to these old-fashioned merchants, so look at the Malyushans from the 1860s and the 1870s, whose family has been doing business in tea forever. In addition to those sorts of folks, there are also people that all of us would simply recognize as entrepreneurs. People who understand modern business. People who understand 
the deployment of capital. People who understand how to make a profit. People who understand how to take a risk. People who understand when to ta stay, take back, stand back from a risk. People who understand how to use blot, it's called in the Soviet period, influence, grease, corruption, in order to get business done. One's, Kuznetsov, he's anonymous. I don't know who he is. But, you know, compare him, you have to allow for time, of course, but compare the two of them to the two of them. This guy, on the other hand, is one of the great industrial magnets of, of, of the late imperial era. Um, Alexander Konovalov, um, whose success in the textile business is international in scope and scale, and that um, a, it's a success that actually allows him to become involved in um, public politics after 1905. A public politics that in many ways is confusing because he supports both um, democratic, conservative democratic liberalism on the one hand and finances the Bolshevik party in 1914 on the other. A separate category altogether are townspeople. Now typically, townspeople, an urban population of upwards of 13 and a half million in 1900, if you actually count the census and the number of people who respond to the census by saying that their legal estate is mieszanstwa, i.e. townspeople, 13 and a half million. We actually don't know a whole lot about these people. And typically, they would be considered middle class. But the term sredni klas is not really applied to them to a degree, very great degree at all. It's a catch-all term. It's a catch-all term for catch-all experiences. So here are to be found artisans who are one or two generations removed, perhaps, from peasant villages, or perhaps have been involved in clock making or wooden bowl making for generations their father and their father and their father before them. They're shopkeepers, and particularly at a time of commercial and industrial expansion, shopkeepers are a key component in any urban setting, even an urban setting like this one. Right? So here's Gastini Dvor, um, the main marketplace in downtown St. Petersburg on Nevsky Prospekt. If you've traveled to St. Petersburg or are planning on traveling to St. Petersburg, um, Gastini Dvor is always a stop on the tourist track. It's actually a Russian shop um, as well, and a deal is to be had there oftentimes in rubles because people have always traded at Gastini Dvor and bargained at Gastini Dvor as well. Townspeople. The clergy. Um, we haven't had a whole lot to say about um, uh, Orthodox Christianity, uh, but this is, is an absolutely key group within imperial society. The census figures here are also uh, in Kuwait, half a million um, clergymen. Um, that's divided up into two main categories. There are actually two groups of clergy in the Russian Empire. One, the so-called black clergy that are monastic and unmarried. These are both men and women, priests, monks, and nuns. And then a second group called the white clergy that actually can marry, have families, bear as their legal estate clergy, duchovienstva, and actually come closest of any of these legal groups to, in fact, being a closed caste. So the first objective of a parish priest is to find a place for his children, his daughters, and his sons within the hierarchy of the parish church. If the son's not going to be a priest, the son can be a psalmster. If not, a psalmster can be um, uh, uh, the sacristan. If not the sacristan, some other lower sub-office that guarantees a livelihood via the church. And daughters, of course, can be married within clergy families. Although sons of priests, and there are so many of them, sons of priests actually is, as a sociological category, is a stream flowing out of the clergy throughout the 19th century. If you think way back, I talked about a guy called Mikhail Spiransky, who was an advisor to Alexander I and told Alexander that he needed to reform and create a constitution. And Alexander exiled him to Tobolsk. Spiransky was the son of a priest. Again, an example of the way in which the legal categories don't match up with, um, with the social reality. This is a militarized state as well. 
Witte at one point in his memoirs laments because he's ultimately a civil servant and his status derives from being a civil servant and essentially derives from executing the law. Russia, she's a, she's a military state. Officers and soldiers occupy key positions in this society, particularly in terms of status. Not only was Nicholas II a nobleman and a landowner, Nicholas II was also, oftentimes only behind his back, referred to as Polkovnik, the colonel. He loved being at summer camp with his guards' regiments. He loved the male camaraderie of summer review. In that sense, you know, I mean, he was, he was a middle class gentleman of the Victorian era. He loved being with the guys. M our, my language, not, not his, but he loved male company. But he was the emperor, and one of his key identities was as a military officer, and that holds true throughout um, the entire family. Not only officers, and they're really of two kinds in this era, and it's also another way of thinking about the sort of rapid change and the elasticity of this society. There are really two kinds of officers. One, probably like this guy, um, derives their rank, their appointment, their standing, perhaps not in some sort of provincial garrison, but in one of the Imperial Guards regiments headquartered in St. Petersburg, derives all of that from the fact that they are of noble birth and that someone knows, knew my father or my grandfather, and thus I hold that appointment. But particularly um, in the second half of the 19th century, especially after the military reforms of the great reforms, which place great emphasis upon military education and military science, the skilled, professional, talented, and educated officer, often a commoner, becomes increasingly important to the modern establishment of this standing army, whose system is described here. You know, a standing army of 750,000 men expanding upwards past a million men uh, after the turn of the century, a system of universal conscription that's designed to extend basic military training to the entire male population, and a reserve system that can be tapped and mobilized from echelons of males all the way up to age 55 a system that will be sorely tested first in the war against Japan and then will be tested and ultimately broken um, in, in the First World War. Again, unbeknownst to them, you will have to mobilize society to fight the First World War, but these plans are already being put in place. She's building a Baltic fleet. She's building a high seas fleet. There's an arms race on for a faster firing rifle and a howitzer that shoots farther and more accurately, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. She is a militarized state. A brand new group in this society, so it's, that song's not just sort of, you know, there for entertainment purposes. If we're witnessing a period of commercial and industrial expansion, guess what comes as a result? Well, um, industrial workers. Small in terms of the population after the turn of the century, perhaps only upwards of, um, two million men and women earning their wage in industrial sectors. Think um, armaments, textiles, um, uh, iron and steel uh, construction, machine making, um, a key sector, of course, of the Industrial Revolution because you have, to act, you have to make machines that can make more machines and that can actually be responsible for this massive expansion of wealth and, and, and capital. Um, they're a mass. The word masses is actually being born here. This picture actually, all of these pictures in some way or another get at it, except for company housing. It's, it's not a great, it's not a status-filled position. As, if, as a matter of fact, the law doesn't even take cognizance of the term rabochi. Most of these people, in terms of their passport, are peasants. I've said this, I think, before, but you know, represented in these pictures are three, maybe four generations of history. The one in my upper uh, right-hand corner in particular is the most interesting one. Largely women in a um, provincial factory town, a textile town, think North Carolina, um, uh, in the 1890s, around the turn of the century. 
It's likely that in this crowd, you have a young woman who for the very first time in her family's history has actually stepped outside the village and ended up in this town. More likely is the fact that you have a young woman in this family whose mother, I think you've heard me say this before, whose mother in her youth performed seasonal work, left the village in the winter to go and work in this town as it was forming, and then went back home in the summer to do field work. And possibly even a grandmother who assembled the skill set in the first place. She never went any place, but in the winter when you couldn't farm, she spun and she wove in her cabin and took that production and handed it to a traveling merchant who himself was assembling capital and eventually creating a textile factory where after the grandmother, the daughter and the granddaughter would eventually make their way and find themselves. This is also an entirely new um, uh, sector of imperial society being um, created. And eventually, of course, what we come back to is where we began. This still remains. And I don't for a moment want to downplay the gargantuan changes that are taking place in the Russian Empire um, during the late imperial era. I don't for a moment want to downplay the amount of modernization and modernity. And I don't care what adjective you use to modify those two nouns, social, economic, cultural, intellectual, add the list as long as you'd like. I don't want to downplay for a moment how far reaching this change actually is. Actually, in fact, not only did you hear Tchaikovsky and then Stravinsky, but you learned to like them both. You actually managed to put them all together into your head in a lifetime. Or perhaps you were repulsed by the one and emancipated by Stravinsky, or thought to yourself, the world is ending. Listen to this music. I don't understand it at all. But at the bottom of this remains the peasantry. Now the peasantry, of course, and I'm concluding, the peasantry, of course, itself is changing dramatically under the impact of the sorts of processes that I've detailed for you here today. So this isn't simply, we talked about it though, a subsistence village where 250, two and a half out of every 10, put it in the context of a village of 500 people. Out of every 10 people, right, every 10 live births, two and a half kids die. I mean, even that is a little bit weird to talk about. Um, but it's also a village that's increasingly being penetrated by a whole variety of voices. By, the, by an urban discourse, by phenomena, what a lousy word that is, right? We'll see next week that there are elections for the very first time in 1905. Here's a peasant who actually votes in those elections. This is interesting, actually, you know, here's a color photograph. That's actually, in fact, you, you find these in the Library of Congress. It's a, a system of plates that are tinted and pressed together and actually create color photography before film technology allowed it to be done. But you get a sense of you know, these three young women and their Sunday garb. And they could be in 1900 or 1800 or 1700 or 1600 probably. That couldn't be in 1800 um, because you know, there's the gramophone. And so what's with these people, right? They're, you know, are they listening to it? Are they posed? Are they proud? Probably all of that. A peasantry that itself actually ultimately perhaps captures the whole, um, well, the dilemma of the late imperial era itself. So here's a huge population. You'll remember the graph, rapidly rising national, but an Asian pattern of development. The lowest standards of living the lowest per capita national income on the continent. This is my all-time favorite photograph. I love this one, right? and I throw it up as much as I can. In the first instance, basically, because they're all young kids. So you know, they're all getting ready to go to the commons. They're also encountering a photographer. So you know, is it the first time that they've ever seen a photographer? Or are photographers always coming to this village? Probably not the latter, but and who knows about the former? I mean, if you get close enough to the photo, you can see actually that some of them are quizzical, 
Some of them are a little uncertain. She's got a huge smile on her face. Um, it is winter, so they're wearing boots. In the summer, they might be barefooted. And it's a scene that's, you know, classically out of a Russian village. Poverty-stricken, poor, muddy, backward. Imagine entertainment in this place. Hence, the it takes a village and the village gate, you know, because there's nothing else to do. You lean on the village gate and you gossip about everybody else. Um, are they a reflection of impoverishment or enrichment? A population that's exploding the way in which Russia's population explodes? Are all of these children being born because the population looks on the future dimly and darkly? Or because it looks on the future with certain expectations, even an embrace of uncertainty? Why do you have big families? Well, you know, there's a birth control argument um, that's always been thrown at me, good Roman Catholic that I am, um, and my four children in, um, in this day and age. But speaking personally, you know, I'm not going to have children unless I actually think that there's something positive um, about, about the future. Now, you know, I'm not going to end um, a scientific discussion on that sort of personal pablum. But there's a huge debate, basically, in the literature that's ongoing and still, I think, unresolved in one of those historians' debates that never will be entirely resolved, but will provide all sorts of publication opportunities, as should be the case for scholars who are going to continue to look at this. Vita's gamble was that industrial expansion, particularly in the Asian style of development that we've seen, was a gamble against time. And that eventually the generation of these amounts of wealth, largely in the urban sectors of the empire, would in fact, he didn't use the verb, but the idea is already there, well before Ronald Reagan started using it, would trickle down um, to the rest of the population. The guy with the gramophone is an example of that trickle, trickle down effect. The boots that these young women are wearing is an example of that trickle down effect. The presence of a photographer in the village is an example of that trickle-down effect. But the gamble was a very serious one because this was, after all, the most backward polity on the European continent. The bulk of whose population lived in places like this. So, you know, we have two more lectures to actually figure out what happened to the place. Um, and we'll do that um, next time, and I'll let Professor Locks get in here. Thanks.